I'm going to be talking to you about the system that I work in. Uh, I'm a disease ecologist, and some of you may be wondering, what the heck is a disease ecologist? So what I do is I study diseases and how they're transmitted between animals in their natural system. And you might be wondering why that's important. And the reason I do it is because it directly reflects the risk that humans might encounter as well. So there's a really cool ecological side, um, and, but it has really relevant public health um, implications for people. And so this is why I actually got into this field of study. I was really interested in how we could look at the habitat and the environment to understand how we can actually make predictions and understand how human disease risk is shaped. So today I'm going to be talking about this, this talk here. The, I was really proud of myself for coming up with this very witty uh, title, A Bloody Meal with a Twist of Lime. Um, and then I realized that here's a lime twist of here, right? Guess what else looks like that? The spirochete that causes Lyme disease, right? This doesn't get any better. Okay, so what we're looking at right here is an amazing creature. And I'm going to talk to you tonight about how the ecology, how what ticks feed on, where they get their bloody meals from in the wild has direct implications on what we can say about disease risk in people. So I don't know if you guys know what you're looking at here, but this is, anyone know what this species is? No one from my lab can answer. I have a bunch of students here from my lab. <laughs> Woo! Okay. So anyone else know what this species is? A lizard, really good. Can anyone be more specific? It is blue belly, yeah. So this is the western fence lizard, our friend and local lizard. And what we have here, are, this is the ear, and this is the nuchal pocket, and they are both completely filled with engorged and bloody ticks. Ew. Okay, so they are totally filled with blood here, and if you're grossed out, you might want to just go outside for the next 20 minutes or so. Okay, so we're really lucky here in the San Francisco Bay Area because we have a ton of beautiful open space, right? Who here likes to go for a nice walk in the woods? Everyone, right? Everyone, hopefully. Um, so here is a nice oak woodland. It's actually a picture taken, um, stolen off the web, um, of Mount Tam. That's a trail in Mount Tam. And you might think, wow, that's a really nice place to go for a hike. We have tons of open space in the Bay Area. But I hate to tell you, but this is the prime habitat for ticks. And ticks are the vector of Lyme disease. Right, And so what, the thing I want you to think about today is how is it that ticks, these little tiny animals that have to attach and feed on a blood meal, and they have to feed for at least 36 to 48 hours before they can transmit a disease. They cannot fly like mosquitoes. They can't jump like fleas. They can't even really deal with being outside of the soil because they're really sensitive to desiccation. So how is it that a disease that's only transmitted by this tick species is the number one reported vector-borne disease in the northern hemisphere, in the US and Europe, okay? Um, so it's pretty amazing. How is it that this species this of tick is so important for transmitting diseases? Well, I'm gonna tell you about that tonight. Okay, so before that, put away your backpacks and your uh, phones. We're going to have a pop quiz. <laughs> We're going to play a game. It's called Vector, Not Vector. So for Lyme disease, the most important way you all can avoid getting Lyme disease, and some of you might be thinking, oh, there's no Lyme disease in California. I'm here to tell you that that is not true. Okay, Lyme disease is definitely here. In fact, some of the most prevalent areas for Lyme disease are right around here, Marin, Sonoma, Mendocino, uh, where we can find sometimes up to 25% infection prevalence in the tick. So the best way, we don't have a vaccine, we don't have good, um, we don't have really good diagnostics. The treatment is, is okay, we can use antibiotics, but the best way to avoid getting Lyme disease is, remember, they have to feed for 36 hours, is, is to identify the tick and remove it. And so it's really important that you be able to identify the tick that transmits Lyme disease. So we're going to play a quiz. 
Is this a vector or not vector? vector. Wrong. <laughs> okay. This is this is a dermocenter occidentalis, adult female tick, does not transmit Lyme disease. Your dog might encounter this tick. This tick loves dogs, but it does not transmit Lyme disease. It does, however, transmit Rickettsia philippii, which is a newly described pathogen, unfortunate. Okay, what about this? Vector, not vector? <laughs> Wrong! <laughs> This is a dermocenter variabilis nymph. It does not transmit Lyme disease. However, it does transmit Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, which can kill you. So watch out for that. Okay, what about this? Vector, not vector. I'm, I'm hearing a more split cloud, crowd here. Not the vector of Lyme disease. This is a dermocenter albopictus larva which does not transmit Lyme disease, but it does transmit a newly described pathogen called Babesia duncani. It's very, very rare, so you don't need to worry about this one too much. What about this one? <laughs> Correct. Yay, you guys got it. Okay, so this is the vector of Lyme disease in California. This is Ixodes pacificus. It's a nymph. One more, one more. This one. I'm hearing confusion. This is a trick question. This one is the same species. It's Ixodes pacificus, but it's a larva. So it does not transmit Lyme disease, but it does transmit Borrelia miyamotoi. Okay, so you should all be pretty scared by now. There are lots of things to worry about. So what's interesting about the ticks is that they have three distinct life stages. So you guys all know Ticks have eight legs, right? They're related to spiders. But the larva has six legs here. Nymphs have eight, and the adults have eight. And this life cycle can take up to three years for them to complete their life cycle. They're incredibly long-lived. And in that time, they only take one blood meal per life stage. And they have this menu option, right? So they basically feed on a variety of vertebrates. They can feed on wood rats. We have native rats here that are actually quite cute. We have deer mice, squirrels, and lizards, which you saw on the opening slide, so they seem to like lizards a lot. So the juvenile stages like to feed on these species here, these sort of smaller bodied species, and then the adult ticks feed on the mule deer for their final meal, and then the males go there to find the females and they mate and reproduce. So as a result, because the larvae actually do not hatch out infected with Lyme disease, they actually have to acquire it from their first blood meal. So they go out and they find a blood meal and whoever they feed on has a big impact on whether or not that tick becomes infected. And then therefore, whether or not they can be infective in the nymphal stage. So they're only infective at the nymphal stage for the first time. They can be infective at the adult stage as well. But um, if you don't notice an adult tick on you for two days, you might have some hygiene issues. Um, a nymphal tick is quite small, however, and so you can easily avoid seeing a tick like that. So this is the stage that we're really interested in, in terms of knowing what the prevalence of infection in this stage is. And of course, people, If they come discoing into the scene, they are sort of incidental hosts. So we are not really part of the natural transmission, but sometimes we can get infected and that can be a problem. So th the important point I really want to get across <laughs> is that nymphs are really, really small. So you might have heard that nymphs are about the size of a poppy seed. Have you guys heard that? We do now. Okay, so nymphs are about the size of a poppy seed. Who here likes poppy seed muffins? <laughs> I'm sorry, but you are never going to be able to eat a poppy seed muffin again because there are, here are five ticks. One, two, three, four, five, five ticks here. And if that hasn't ruined your appetite, here's what they look like after they take a blood meal. <laughs> That's one full tick. 
Okay, so they're really small. Remember, this is what you're looking for when you go out hiking. You need to look for something that is the size of a poppy seed and is semi-transparent. So good luck with that. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you a bit about why Lyme disease has emerged. Now, a lot of people think that Lyme disease is new, that it came out of nowhere. But in fact, it's actually really, really old. What's happened is the way that people are interacting with their environment. And so this is what the East Coast looked like in 1890. Um, it was mostly farmlands. But around the 1950s, a lot of those farmlands were uh, started to be abandoned as a lot of those farms moved to the Midwest. And so this is what the East Coast looks like now. It's been reforested. So these are secondary forests, maple, big leaf maple, um, oak trees, beech wood, all kinds of um, hardwood trees here. And of course, when the forest returned, so did some of the vertebrate animals that live in these forests. And so we had the return of mice. This is a white-footed mouse. And here's a deer as well. And you know who else likes these animals? Ticks. So when these animals started to rebound and to recolonize these habitats because they were no longer farmlands, then the ticks returned. And the other important point to keep in mind is that although these species returned, top predators like pumas, which used to occupy the East Coast, did not return. Right? And so there's no checks on the deer population and um, some checks on the deer mice, but these are very, very abundant species. And so I just want to show you a quick video More than here. A freckle. To grow into an adult, it needs one blood meal, a big one. The front of its body is all mouth. It digs into us using two sets of hooks. The hooks wriggle into the skin. They pull our flesh out of the way and push in this mouth part, the hypostome. Those hooks anchor the tick to us for the long haul, like mini harpoons. Okay, so that is just a, a little bit of a horrific scene for you guys to see what's actually happening when the tick bites you. And I think earlier on you saw some beautiful skin. That was actually my grad student, Ariel, who's in the audience. She was the only person that a tick in my lab would bite, and so she got to have her skin on this video produced by KQED. Um, I recommend you go check out the whole video. It's really cool. They do a wonderful job. Uh, KQED Deep Look does a bunch of different really cool biological processes. So, you know, that's what's happening when a tick bites. It's inserting, it's hypostome, it's barbing itself in you, it's really not letting go. And so this interaction of ticks biting people became much more common on the East Coast with the reforestation of the East Coast. So the first cases of Lyme disease were reported in 1975. At the time, they didn't know what it was, but they knew that there were these weird symptoms. These children that kind of lived out in the forest were coming down with a weird rash and arthritis. So children don't typically get arthritis, thankfully. Um, and so they knew that they were dealing with something, and so there was a lot of investigations. And then it took about six years before a bacteriologist, Willie Bergdorfer, um, def uh, defined the spirochete, isolated it, um, and, and figured out that it was a spirochete, and somebody else named it after him. So now it's called Borrelia burgdorferi. That's the name of the pathogen that causes this characteristic bullseye rash that's associated with Lyme disease. And they determined that it was transmitted by a tick called Ixodes scapularis. And so if you guys do the math, Willie Burgdorfer defined Borrelia burgdorferi in about 1981 which means that it's about as old as the oldest millennial. So it's not actually that old. When I first started working on it, it was still considered new, but now it's considered emerging because although it's been around for a while, it's emerging because it keeps getting more and more common, right? More and more prevalent. And so here's a, a graph. You guys are okay with data, right? Okay, I thought so. I thought you guys, you guys like data. So I'm gonna show you a few data slides. I want you to give it up for data. So this is the CDC. The number of reported cases of Lyme disease, you can see from 1997, there were about 12,000 cases reported. And then in 2017, close to 30,000. And so the symptoms of Lyme disease, if you aren't familiar with it, because it's not super common here on the West Coast, are fever, fatigue, chills, headache, joint aches, very vague symptoms, right? Aside from that bullseye rash, 
A lot of these symptoms are very vague, so it's very difficult to diagnose. And it's also really difficult to detect because it's not actually in your blood for very long. And so that's why the CDC released these cases of the number of probable cases as well that we're probably missing. And it could be, it could be a little bit higher than that as well. So the, like cases of Lyme disease keep emerging. Most of these are occurring in the Northeast. So New York, you know, that area. Not so much California. In California, we do have Lyme disease, but it, the cases are much, much lower, and it seems to be staying pretty steady. So where Lyme disease occurs is where there are ticks that transmit that pathogen. So some of you might hear about Lyme disease in Australia, but there's no Lyme disease in Australia because the ticks that transmit it are not there. So it's the Northern Hemisphere. It's in Asia and Europe and the East Coast and um, the West Coast here. So here we are in the West Coast where we have our very own vector, Ixodes pacificus. Woo, give it up for Ixodes pacificus. It's making its, it's making its way on its own. Okay, so Ixodes pacificus is related to all these other Ixodes species, but you might be wondering, I, I, you know, I was going to talk to you about why it's emerging, right? And the, the answer is we don't exactly know. We know that land use changes has had an effect, so the abandonment of a lot of those farmlands has a, a huge impact. We know that host ecology changes, so the proliferation of hosts that are really good for transmitting Lyme disease um, without good predators also present has an effect. And we know that probably climate change has an impact as well, because we know that climate, ch yeah, give it up for climate change. Um, we know that climate change is um, leading to the expansion of Ixodes scapularis north into Canada. So now Canada is starting to see more Lyme disease as well. The other factor is also just more awareness. So people know about this disease. They, they know to have their doctors test for it, and there are more diagnostic tests. So all of these are contributing to the emergence of Lyme disease, but it's, it's really hard um, to, to measure a lot of these things. As a scientist, it's really hard to measure the impacts of Lyme disease. It requires lots and lots of data that go back many, many years and have really controlled measurements. But so what I want to talk to you for the rest of my talk tonight is to talk to you about what we're dealing with here on the West Coast, which if you know anything about Lyme disease, most likely you're thinking about what we know about Lyme disease from the East Coast. And it turns out in California, it's really, really different. Yes, we are our own thing. Okay, so. On the east coast, we have Ixodes capillaris, and I've already shown you a picture of that white-footed mouse. They are really popular, very prevalent hosts of Ixodes capillaris. They're really good at feeding ticks, and they're really good at transmitting Lyme disease. There are other species as well. These, this is a shrew. Here's a chipmunk. They're, these are all involved in transmitting Lyme disease on the east coast. On the other hand, in California, <laughs> we have... We have these species like wood rats and deer mice and squirrels, and then this guy, right? So we know this guy plays an important role. So here's another picture of another lizard, and it's also riddled with ticks. So you might be getting the hint that this is a really important host for Ixodes pacificus here on the West Coast. And it turns out that there is a lot of variation in the relative contribution of all of these different hosts to Lyme disease transmission. So this is a term that we call reservoir competency. So reservoir competency is the ability of a host to effectively transmit the pathogen to a tick. So a tick that attaches to this species here, a wood rat, has a really high chance of getting infected. Whereas a tick that it attaches to a deer mouse, this um, Paramiscus maniculatus, has sort of a so-so chance of getting infected. And then a tick that attaches to a, a lizard which is a very, very um, preferred host for Ixodes pacificus, has zero chance of getting infected with Lyme disease. And not only that, but if a tick that is infected attaches to a lizard, this western fence lizard, that lizard will kill the bacteria in the feeding tick. So it's a pretty amazing effect. And so for a long time, you know, people thought that the western fence lizard was really important for reducing Lyme disease risk in California. And, um, but, you know, when I was in grad school, I started thinking, well, okay, they, they do kill the bacteria in a tick, but they're such important hosts for the tick. So whereas on the east coast, that white-footed mouse feeds the majority of the ticks, 
in the West Coast, this western fence lizard feeds about 90% of all of those larvae and nymphal ticks. So they're really important for maintaining high tick populations. And so um, I wanted to ask, well, what is the net effect of these lizards? So they have these opposing roles, right? So they are really important for feeding ticks, and they're also a pathogen killer. So what is it? What is it more important? Is it the fact that they feed a lot of ticks or the fact that they kill a lot of bacteria? And so they play this duplicitous role. And so I did what many ecologists before me have done. I just took the lizards away. This wasn't... Um, so I wanted to ask this question, what is the impact of lizards on Lyme disease risk? What is the net impact? And so I'm gonna just walk through the three easy steps for changing species composition. So the first step is you go out and you go to a fishing store and you buy a fishing pole. And you tie some floss on the end of it and you make a noose. And you take that noose and you go out into the woods and you sneak up on a lizard that is just minding its own business. You lower the noose over the head, and then you jerk up the fishing pole really quickly. And that lizard doesn't know what hit them. And pretty soon, you have a lizard at the end of a pole. And I, I promise you, they're fine. They're totally fine. This lizard is having the time of its life. <laughs> So we catch a bunch of lizards, and I did this over six different hectare plots. So a hectare is about 100 meters by 100 meters. It was a lot of lizards. We removed about 500 lizards from the field. Um, and then we just, we just gave them a little vacation, and we deposited them in another location not too far from where they're from. And so we deposited them, and then we measured what happened to the tick population. Okay, now, you guys ready for the second data slide? Okay. Okay, so what did we find? We have standard error bars. Woo. Okay, and we have some, you know, mathematical notations here. Okay, so what we did was we removed all the lizards, and then we went back in the next year to look at what happened to the tick population. And we found that when we removed the lizards, that there were fewer ticks in those populations the next year. So fewer nymphal ticks. So that means that tick, the, those lizards were really important for maintaining high populations of ticks. You remove the lizards and suddenly the number of ticks out there plummet. The really surprising thing was, is we found that when you remove the lizards, we also found fewer infected ticks. So here is a control and a removal, and you can see two asterisks here showing you statistical significance. And so what we found was that when we removed all the lizards, that the number of infected ticks in the site dropped a lot. And so lizards, if you reverse that, that's saying that lizards are actually increasing disease risk. Okay, so the, the role of these lizards is really complex. When I first published this study, there were a lot of people out there that thought that I was advocating for eradicating lizards. I am not. I'm just advocating for better ecological data so that we understand these interactions, okay? So the, to sum up my talk, I wanted to just sort of express to you that what we know about Lyme disease emergence is that it's really, really complex. It's linked to historical land use history. It's linked with changing animal populations and ecological interactions. It's linked to climate change and also to human behavior, right? So where people tend to spend their time. So it's really complex, it's really interesting, there's still a lot that we are looking to study. Um, and you know, that's sort of the, the take home message here. And then I also just wanted to end with this um, picture here. So I have to admit, the first thing I did when I found out that I was going to be sharing the stage with a mime <laughs> was I thought, you know, ticks do this really interesting behavior, the adult ticks. They'll climb up to the top of a grass stalk or something, and then they will wave their arms around like this. <laughs> it's called questing. And they have these little barbs on the end of their arms that they use to detect hosts, and then they have little, little hooks on them so they can attach to things and then take their blood meal. So they do this behavior called questing, and I thought, maybe <laughs> it's actually just a very complex mime movement. Okay, so that's my mime pun. 
Okay, so that's all I have for you guys tonight. Go to nerdnight.com to find a Nerd Night event near you. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for our latest presentation.